recording over here. Okay. Oh, let's start. We're on. Okay. We're recording. Fantastic. Thank you. Y'all ready? Yes. Okay. How to use Bring. the research skills framework. We will take it away and I will let Tomomi start by introducing herself. Are you going to share your screen? Oh, do you not see it? Yes, I, I can see it. Oh, yes, we can see it. It's, uh, there's a photo of you, Tomomi. What? <laughs> okay. I don't see it, but that's okay, because I know what the slides look like. All right. Okay, now we're starting. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us after work um, in such sunny weather. Um, we're really happy to be here with both uh, Barcelona and Madrid and kind of places in between, I believe, um, researchers and people who do research. Um, so yeah, we have 90 minutes today. As Sarah mentioned, it's going to be a workshop. Um, and so we'll have a couple different sections, some with talks, some with activities. Um, so let me get started. Um, yeah, so my name is Tomomi. I'm based in Paris, but I'm from Tokyo originally. Um, I work as a designer at an independent design consultancy called AQ. Um, I'm also a co-founder and producer of Design Research Tokyo, which is a meetup very much like this one. Um, that's about two years old now. Um, and I'm also on the board of the research ops community, which is where the research skills framework kind of began. And this is Dave. Mute, mute. Classic. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Dave. I'm based in Berlin right now. And uh, yes, I've been working on this project with Tomomi and the research ops community for, for quite some time now. You can see I did not prepare my slide as nicely as she did, but I am the, the research manager at ResearchGate based in Berlin. I like research. Um, maybe more interestingly is I've spent now time as the first researcher starting the program at uh, six different organizations. So mostly in the startup context, I've been able to see what it looks like to bring research to bear. All right, that is enough about me. Yep, so we have three goals for the, the next 90 minutes. One is to introduce a set of perspectives of just how to think about the work that we do. Um, we're going to walk you through the research skills framework, um, do a couple of activities, which you have hopefully already started because we had homework, um, and show you a few ways to use it afterwards. And also, we have uh, time for breakouts so that you get to meet other people um, that have joined us today. Um, yeah, this is the Slido link in case you missed it from Sarah. Uh, we will have time, I think, after the 90 minutes probably, um, but happy to stay as long as there are questions. So where we first started this idea of even kind of building a, a, a framework, these were the questions that we found that people were asking themselves regardless of where they were in their careers. Um, what next for me? How do I get there? What does better? What, what does a better researcher even look like? How do I find resources and mentors? And kind of the big question, I think that's so important to everybody, how can I have more influence, more impact, and more purposeful work? And what we realized, you know, even though we set out first to build a framework, it's not that framework itself isn't what moves the needle. Um, what helps us take action is the tool, but also different inspiration around us. We need the space to reflect. We need the peer community, such as this one today. Um, and we kind of need to have these conversations to help make sense of who we are currently as practitioners and also where we need to go. Um, so the way that we built this framework, or as we ran it as a project, was um, with, the, with the research ops community, as, as we've mentioned before, uh, a big part of the, the, the process was in holding workshops around the world where we had people um, from the community in different cities organizing local, like in-person um, workshops. 
with a kit that we had prepared and that those became opportunities for people to discuss these topics, but also send us back some data so that it feeds into the, the framework. Um, yeah, shout out to the workshop that was held in Madrid. I did see Juliana in one of the grids. Do you wanna pop in and say hello? We chatted yesterday. Hi guys, it's very nice to be here and see the result of uh, every, uh, everything that they did. Yeah, it's so cool to, and maybe, I don't know if there are a couple people who even attended the workshop, would love to know if you could put that in the chat. Um, but yeah, so we held this type of workshops around the world. Um, and one year later, this is where we are. So let's do our first activity, which is this kind of a warm up. So Dave, since he is now host, will help set up some breakout rooms who are going to randomly place you in a room with three or four people. Um, please do a quick round the table about your name, what's your work, why you decided to join today. Um, if you've had time to do the homework, please share any impressions that you had. If you haven't, um, anything you've kind of impressions from the website I think would be great to learn. Um, we're gonna stay in this same group for the next activity. So please uh, use this opportunity to get to know each other. We'll call you back in 10 minutes. Okay, I will pause the recording. Okay, nice. So, let's talk about the research skills framework. In this next bit, we'll try to go a little bit quick and make up the three minutes that I lost by being a poor Zoom host. And we'll tell you what the, what the framework consists of and how to think about all the different pieces of it. So first, the big piece of it, the core of it, are all the craft skills. And we consider that a, a pattern language of craft skills. And that has direction for, like a prescriptive direction for you to actually learn and use these skills different ways to look at how you might power up these skills and resources. And then as you've hopefully seen with the homework, there are also tools. And uh, the skills and themes inventory is probably the most basic, but a number of other different tools that you can use to access different pieces of the framework. So a conceptual model of what the framework is starts with this idea of a craft skill pattern. I'll show you an example in a little bit. But something that's interesting about this set of skills is that they're all networked. So some craft skills depend on having other craft skills and some craft skills unlock other craft skills. There's a, let's say like a side type of skill that we'll go into a little bit later called a human skill. Um, maybe you used to call those soft skills, but we're calling them human skills because I think they're, they're actually at the core of how we do our work. And again, we'll touch on that later. Within each craft skill pattern, what you get are um, a bunch of different fields, and instead of describing it to you, I'll show you an example. So an example of one of these skills is well-managed data. And it's written in the style of a pattern, and that means that there is a set, well, there's a theme for this skill, there is the place that it sits in the research process. You see right here that well-managed data is part of the analyzed phase of the research process. There's a description of what leads up to this skill. In this case, of course, you need to have a study plan and participants and then actually capture data in interviews so that you can manage your data well. And then the pattern goes on to describe what it means to do this well in terms of the challenge that you face and the solution that you have. So we could talk about the specifics of it a lot, but all of these are available for you on the website. So I'll let you take a look at something like this at all of them from researchskills.net. The inspiration for how these are laid out, very near and dear to my heart, um, I see at least Sarah smiling, um, is Christopher Alexander's pattern language. And of course, that's developed originally for architecture. What you see here on the left are a set of patterns that, when selected and networked together, actually kind of describe the, the whole piece of what you need to build a, a healthy project, in this case, a house for one person. And that's some of the idea behind what we've done with ours. But it's not a lecture on pattern languages, so just keep this idea in mind. And I'll 
I'll leave this uh, statement with you that is a personal belief of mine, not yet proven. Um, pattern language is the most interesting and flexible structure for communicating expert practical knowledge with a built-in concern for quality of outcome. So if you believe that to be true, you could imagine that, of course, this is a sensible format to encapsulate the work of research. Uh, and as you explore the skills, maybe, maybe you will see and believe that it's true. Now I showed you Christopher Alexander's uh, a small set of his patterns. If you look at our uh, research skill framework and all of the patterns in it, this is how they look when they're zoomed out right now. That relationship is not particularly useful or easy to work with, but I just wanted to show you a, a bird's eye view of all of the different skills that we've identified and how they sort of flow cyclically around this research process. So back to the conceptual view, you have all the craft skill patterns in the network language, the human skills on the side, but to make it a little more useful, what we've done is group each of these craft skill patterns into themes. So here's an example. In the interview planning and execution theme, you see a number of different specific craft skills. So you can click on any one of those and see the same type of thing that I showed you for well-managed data. And together, this is one area of skills that you can assess your mastery of as you use the framework. There are 13 themes overall. And the way that we have put these themes together is in a value chain. So I showed you interview planning and execution. And you can see that sort of there in the bottom middle, we have interview planning and execution. The point of this value chain is to say that all of these things that we do serve some anchor of organizational needs. And something way down at the bottom, like coordination and data management is foundational, but maybe not visible or influential for what the organization needs. And then if you look at something way up at the top, like providing strategic direction, uh, it's much more visible, it's much more influential, but it actually relies on everything down the chain. You can't set strategic direction unless you are able to understand what the business needs, broadcast your findings, synthesize those results from the interviews where you've coordinated people and managed the data. So it's almost like this is our picture of a roadmap of what you would do from the bottom up to build towards more and more strategic research skills. So back to the conceptual picture, this is what it looks like. And just to refresh each node there, is a bunch of these different skills in a theme. And that's, uh, that's the core of how the framework works. So we're going to jump in and actually try to use it really quickly here. There's one other piece of the framework that I just briefly mentioned, and I showed it to you in the pattern. And that was the idea of the research process model. There are, in our, in our view, six phases of the research process model. You can, of course, take any process model that you like. This one maps pretty nicely to uh, any other type of process model. You could see the first diamond of the double diamond in the first three and the second diamond of the double diamond in the second three. But you'll just note that as you look at any skill we have, it indicates um, from this view which piece, which part of the process it's in. Okay, so that was a really, really fast review of the pieces of the research skills framework. And now what we're gonna do is actually have you dig into an exercise. So I'm gonna copy this link unless someone has already pasted it in the chat. And okay, excellent. Um, everybody, please go to this link. We're gonna take a 10, 15 minute time and go through an activity here. Um, so I'll pull this thing up and take a look. As you get in, you can see, hopefully, uh, that there, you got to zoom out quite a bit, maybe. You're all kind of zoomed in there. Um, there's too many, there's 64 of them. But what you do is go find one of these places now and put your name in the blue up top where it says claim this space. You can put your real name if it's okay that uh, people know that this is your map, or if you want to put a code name, please do that. But uh, claim a space with the blue and 
Again, I see a lot of you are in the same area where it looks like there's nothing there. You're gonna have to zoom out and actually quite a bit. And the way you can do that if you don't scroll is in the bottom right, there's a little minus sign. Click that minus sign, get to like 5%, and then you will see that there are a bunch of different board areas that you can claim. Okay, are we getting somewhere? Nice. So quickly take that blue line of text and write something there so that nobody else takes your map space. Once you've zoomed out quite a bit, now, I see that a bunch of you have, have gathered these map areas. So we're gonna go into it. Um, if you don't have a place or haven't figured it out, please just chat to me and I'll take a look at it uh, and we can figure it out. But let's start stepping through these pieces. So if you did your homework, what the homework helped you do was pick some of these themes already that are important and useful to you, maybe three or five themes and the first thing that we want to do, if you did your homework, pick those three or five themes that were highlighted and drag them into the middle of the board. So you've got all the way on the right of your board there, you've got a bunch of these different things, uh, all of the 13 themes from the value chain, drag them into the middle of the map template. Let's see here. Okay, nobody's chatted me that they have problems. How is everyone doing? Are we able to pull those themes into the middle of our map? I'm gonna make one too and test it. So you'll, you'll have to zoom back in um, once you've gotten there. And then on the right side, there are those different themes. There's a dot with some words next to it. Click that and drag those things to the middle of your map whichever ones you want to work with. Okay, how are we doing? Are people getting, I see some dots moving into the middle of maps, that's awesome. Okay, so when you have a few of these themes, skills that you're actually using, the point of all this is to see how well we are, or how well we've mastered these skills to judge relatively one versus the other. And then of course, to see how these skills support each other. So, we will dig in here and the first thing to do, once you've picked which skills you're gonna put in the middle, is first just drag each of them from the left to the right based on the level of mastery. Um, zero on this all the way at the left means you don't know what it is and don't know how to do it. One means that you're aware of it and four means that you're an expert and you can teach it. So if it's a two, you need practice and if it's a three, you're, you're getting quite good at it. So take each of the skills, again, that you've identified and want to be working with, and the first thing to do is just move them all left to right along this zero, one, two, three, four, and try to play with the relative idea, or the, the relative position of them, but your relative level of mastery. There's a lot of people in a lot of places here. Okay, so remember, we have the skills on the right and those are all clickable and draggable. And so you can play with them. And if you don't have your own board, you'll just need to zoom out quite a bit to get your own board. All right, nice. So, have you positioned them from the left to the right in terms of your level of mastery? Hopefully the things that you're, you're quite skilled at now are all the way to the right. Um, whatever thing that you are the best at and could teach hands down is probably a four, probably all the way to the right. And those things that are the newest for you are probably all the way to the left. It's all relative, so what's important is where they sit relative to each other, maybe more so than the absolute rating. Now, I'll assume that you've got a few of these moved from the left to the right, and it's probably easier just to work with a small set of three or five if you're not familiar with this format already. The next thing that we're gonna do is now move them and place them along the vertical axis. So up high, 
means that it has a lot more influence on the organization, a lot more visibility, um, maybe gets closer to that anchor of what the organization needs from a research practice. And down low means it's a little more foundational. It's, you could say it's invisible, but it's also extremely important nonetheless. So for example, if coordination and data management is one of the themes that you've dragged in the middle, that may be all the way at the bottom uh, because it's rare that what the organization ultimately needs from you is coordinating participants and managing data. But that is a skill that can support some others more highly. If you're not sure how to rate these things relatively uh, from top to bottom, to the left of your map area is our value chain. And you can also use that as a model for how the skills are laid out in a top to bottom point of view. I'll give you a moment to play with that piece. So the question you should be asking yourself here is ultimately, which of these skills have the most impact for me? Which of these skills give me the most leverage in the organization? <coughs> Excuse me, give me the most leverage in the organization. And whichever thing that you do that you think has the ultimate highest amount of impact, uh, that should probably be up the highest for you. Okay, zooming around. So at this point, theoretically, and I know this is a, an interesting format, it's a little bit tricky, but hopefully you're, you're playing along. You've got things from left to right and you've got things top to bottom um, in terms of your level of mastery and how, how well they are influential in the organization. A final bonus activity, if you're done with that, is to connect them and ask yourself, which of these skills depend on the other skills that I use? If something is necessary for a, a skill that's above it, you should just be able to tap L and connect them with a line. If you're not sure where to connect them, you can also use our value chain as a model. doing all right. So remember, the questions that you're asking yourself here are, which of these skills have I mastered? Which of these skills am I learning? How relatively important are these skills in terms of building influence in my work, in my organization? And if you're getting a little bit further, maybe you're going to ask yourself, how do these skills support one another? Which of these skills are necessary and enable the ones above them? Or which skills depend on the ones below them? So I'll pause for just a minute or two, let you think about that, and then I'll give you the final pieces here, and we can talk a little bit about what this activity really means. Now, theoretically, each of these ultimately ladders up to that middle top anchor, the organizational needs, uh, just like in our value chain. And maybe an interesting question to ask is, if for some reason you think that how you use this skill right now does not ultimately support what the organization or the client needs, uh, why are you doing that? Okay, we've got a bunch of maps at a number of different states. Um, so we'll, we'll push on and the two things that I will say about this is that you will be able to continually access this for a while after the meetup. And there's a full activity guide that actually walks you through the detailed steps that you can also see on the, the research skills framework. So the goal here is to get you to play with and, and just start to think and see in this format about how these different skills relate to one another uh, so that you'll have a sense of what we're gonna show you next. In the last one or two minutes, if you have already connected some of your skills and you have uh, positioned them relative to each other, the last thing to look at might be, take a look at any skills that you have in the 
let's say between zero and one or between zero and two. Think about for those skills, what you may be doing to actually learn and develop there. Do you have what you need to actually like practice this skill in a safe way? Do you know what it means to get better at it? This is uh, just one of the reflective questions we can ask. Now, somewhere between one and a half to three, uh, one, one or two to three, if you've got any skills in there, we tend to consider that the, the zone of practice. And rather than just learning in, in little targeted ways, we think that these are the skills that, in terms of your development, are the most important to be really doing projects around, to have really contribute to the outcome of your work. So the question here is, are you actually able to do this type of thing? Are you able to practice the skills in this realm and actually start pushing them forward to mastery? Now, of course, if you're following the trend, you know there's one other area over to the right, and that's anywhere from 2.5 to 3, all the way to 4. And these are the things that you're pretty good at. You, you've mastered, you've hopefully uh, been able to push aside Something interesting that we found is that for some researchers, they never really get past doing that thing. And what I mean is they get to the point where they've mastered a skill, but they actually have to keep doing it day in and day out and haven't been able to push away from that and go to a higher order skill. So the question for you, if you've got things that are in that three to four range is, are you able to teach someone else to do this thing? Can you document it and actually speed up your progress every time you have to do it? Is it something you might just be able to, to delegate or not do? This is our, our zone of consolidation on the far right. And you know, everything that you do, you spend time on it. And if you're already an expert at these things, but you're continually spending your time there, you're losing the opportunity to invest in new areas or to experiment and develop in new ways. All right. How is it looking? I see a bunch of maps. Uh, some people are way up out there. We've got some connections. We've got some pieces laid out. So like I said, you'll be able to go back and play with this uh, and actually really connect your value chain and explore further. But for now, let's come on back. So you can leave this tab open. You can play with it. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll actually show you how we've used this format and how to move through this format to look at some of the insights for the research skills uh, from the Research Skills Framework Project. OK. If you're still in there and just loving drawing boxes and dragging lines in Miro, uh, come on out for a moment. Remember, you'll be able to go back. Just leave that tab open. And let's talk about growth and impact. So uh, yes, there is a full guide for this activity. Uh, we put it in Miro so that you can play with it. But it's something that you can do with pen and paper, with sticky notes on your table. Uh, the format's quite, uh, quite flexible. And I'll, I'll teach you what, uh, what we found in that format. But first, a note is that the insights that I'm going to present to you next in this mapping format come from all of the different participants in the research skills framework. Uh, sorry, in the research skills, researcher skills workshops. Um, all around the world, you can see there. And if you look, 152 researchers, 81 designers who do research, and 32 others from the in-house private sector are the bulk of where these, this data is coming from. So when I show you what's next, just remember that a lot of it is developed from the perspective of in-house private sector. If that's not you, um, these are just references. They're just ways to explore and look at this data, but they're not the answer. So here is what we've developed in this same format that you just played with, and I hope that by experimenting with it, you've had a chance to at least get a sense of what this format means. And now I think this will make it um, stick a little bit better. Where it comes from is a gentleman named Simon Wardley. And he developed this as actually a way for 
mapping out value chains of socio-technical systems of capital and he uses it as a strategic tool for determining where to invest in technology organizations. There is a thriving community around this format of Wardley mapping. Um, I'll encourage you to look at it and I think our guide actually lists the resources there. If you want, I would write down the phrase crossing the river by feeling the stones and it's a, a keynote that he's given maybe like 20 or 40 times. You can find that video and watch it if you'd like to dig into the format. But let me show you now what we've identified from this project using this format. So we're trying to break away from the strict role levels. And uh, nonetheless, I'll tell you, this is what maybe a junior researcher's picture might look like. But we're calling it the growing stage. And so from all of those people who participated in our workshops, from our own experience and from the way that we analyzed the data, here's a picture of what we saw. Someone who's just growing into the role may really only have four skill areas. And in this case, it's a profile of somebody who, let's say, is one or two years into the role. And you can see that they're totally experts at coordinating and managing data. They can get the people that they need. Maybe they started as a, a coordinator. And now they're almost an expert at evaluative testing. They can do some of the basic stuff. Maybe that's running remote or unmoderated usabilities, usability studies, other pieces like that. In the zone of practice, they're working on debrief and analysis, which means after the interview, how you actually make sense of and gather that initial uh, sense of what you saw there. And in the zone of learning, we see that they're finally stepping up and getting into this area of interview planning and execution. So what's encapsulated here for this profile? And on the website, you can read a full essay about what each of these things mean for a person who's growing into the role, is that their scope right now really has to do with just running specific interviews, um, getting to the point of being able to plan for and collect the data, but it may not be at that higher order of end-to-end -end research projects yet. They're just starting to learn there. So take a look at this next one. Here is someone, maybe you would say mid-level, we'll call it capable in the role. Notice that everything that you saw, each of those four skills in the chain, that existed in the prior one have now evolved to the right. So what's happened is that what was in the zone of learning before, let's say two years later, interview planning and execution, is now something that this researcher has mastered. And it's actually something that they're, they're starting to consolidate. And maybe in this case, that means they're setting up templates and scripts and best practices for the organization about running basic interviews. Here now, for a more mid-level researcher, the scope gets a little more interesting and the themes that they're really working on that are emerging now are synthesis, stakeholder engagement, and structured modeling. And it's one thing to run interviews and actually debrief and analyze the data. And it's another thing, a newer skill to be able to turn that into provocative insight rather than a recount of what we've seen, a way to push design forward. So for this researcher, this capable researcher in the middle layer, we're saying that in their zone of practices, this idea of synthesis and a number of uh, skills that fit under this theme are simple things like running various workshops. Um, oh boy, of course I should know what all of them are. I will tell you, I will tell you later. Um, the other thing that's coming up now is that as this more capable researcher is owning entire projects, they're, they're really being able to partner with perhaps design and product in a more end-to-end -end fashion is stakeholder engagement. So this theme in terms of the specific skills we have is right now just uh, stakeholder assumption work uh, stakeholder assumptions workshops and stakeholder interviewing, but it also encapsulates a lot more of that work that has to happen just around working with more people, understanding their role in the organization and keeping them informed of the process in a project. And again, full details are on the insights report for a capable researcher. So take a look at where stakeholder engagement and structured modeling are here, because, oh, wrong computer. There we go. Now you see that just like before, the skills that were in the zone of learning and that were kind of new are pushing all the way to the right. So stakeholder engagement is something that they're fairly well practiced at. The structured models like jobs to be done, personas, uh, 
service blueprints and journey maps or something that are they're consolidating. We've actually summarily removed this idea of framing the work and push it into the next two. So I won't explain this theme to you uh, deeply. You can just think about it as now split out into integration and service delivery and broadcasting. But when we look at a person who's thriving in the role, maybe a senior researcher, five, seven, eight years of experience, you can see that many of these skills about actually running the research and making sense of it, they're they're quite practiced in. And what comes to the fore and what becomes difficult now is actually aligning that work to service and product delivery and broadcasting. And of course, um, things like basic usability reports are coming out from early on, but actually being able to incept the point of view of more complex and more nuanced user needs or more strategic implications into the organization are some of the harder challenges that more senior researchers face. So this map shows that as you get beyond just doing the work and making sense of it, the new types of challenges you have are actually shaping the work to fit the way the organization works and to send the message outward in all of the right ways. And then you see on the left, some of those super higher order skills like uh, actually aligning with the business, amplifying the practice itself and setting strategic direction are waiting in the wings. Okay, that's enough uh, talking about these maps. Just a final piece there. All of these were the craft skills expressed through the craft skills themes. Um, take a look at our insights reports and you can dive into each skill uh, under the skills tab on the framework. Okay, let's switch gears um, and spend a couple of minutes looking at what we're calling the human skills. So as a reminder, the human skills are what amplifies the craft skills that, that Dave was explaining. On the right are the full set of human skills that we have in our framework. So I won't go through each one, um, but I want to introduce you this model that we call the human actor layers as a way to think about how we might want to improve our ability um, on all these different skills. So these obviously could be, you know, have their own frameworks, each and every one of them themselves. Um, but we think that, okay, one useful way to look at it is who is it that we want to engage with? Um, so on the left, you see the base uh, model uh, where we start from self. Thank you. Um, okay. so. You'll see that on the right, the, the blue circle is highlighted on self. So as a human skill, the first human we have to take care of is ourselves and how we hold ourselves in our work. Um, who we are, how we're feeling that day actually has a, a huge impact on the way that we do the work and in things like the manner in which we interview people and then our, our ability to be mindful about the work, the work that we do. So that's first layer. Second one is about how to influence your immediate team and your immediate project that you've been assigned to. And so if you want to build your influence here, you might want to look at um, uh, better ways to manage the research process or just how the, the project is managed um, and try to increase the, the ownership or agency you have over the way the, the project is done. Third is uh, a challenge that we hear very often, right? How can I get my research insights translated into product decisions? Um, and so we think there are two things that are super useful in carrying this out. One is to improve our understanding of the service concepts and also our ability to build cross-functional partnerships. So that's how do we engage with designers, developers, salespeople, like different functions within the organization. And so this one is about just the entire business or depending on our business line or depending on the size of your company, the entire organization. Um, and to do this, this will become a bit more of a, of a senior play, but where it's really important to start evangelizing um, on value of research or increase our ability to understand and talk in the language of business and strategy. 
Next one is about, um, it's not just within our own organizations that we can uh, increase our impact as researchers. It's really important to exchange and build relationships over time with people outside of our companies and communities, such as this one. Um, so this is also uh, another really important skill. And then there are some skills that are just transversal across all of the, the different layers. And these are things like workshop facilitation. Um, if you look at the craft skills, you'll notice that there are quite a few workshops involved in the, in the work of research. So this is a kind of a, a, a great lever to increase our impact. Interpersonal relationships, our ability to present and tell the story and stakeholder management. Um, and so, yeah, these are, useful for any parts of the layer. I would also say for anybody who is still um, in the early days of developing your craft skills, but if you're coming from a different career, for instance, or if you're a d designer or analyst um, that is also starting to do more research work, you might already have a lot of these skills um, and they will be of great value in amplifying the, the craft skills that you're still building up. So, Yes, so let's do one more activity. Um, we talked about building your craft skills, mapping them, and the human skills. Um, so we want to do one more activity around looking at your environment um, at work and answer this question. Answer this question on the right. When does your work environment best help you learn and grow? And so we'll use this roundtable uh, format where if somebody could be a timekeeper per group, um, so one minute per person, tell me a story about dot, dot, dot. It helps to tell a, like a specific episode rather than general ideas. And then do a round two, that's a follow-up or an elaboration, and then have a open discussion for how much ever time you have left. And I am gonna share the, um, the slides. So I just put that in the chat. And so if each group could appoint a note taker and then from page 46 onwards, there's a slide for each group. Um, and if you could take notes so that we can share the discussions with everyone outside of your group later on, this would be great. Dave, do we have enough? Tell me how many groups we have. We've got a few groups. So I'm sending you back into breakout rooms. Um, some of you are newer joiners who haven't been assigned to a room yet and I will add you into them. But uh, yeah, look at this slide. Pick a, a corresponding slide with numbers, with your group's breakout number and, and go through this. I think we've got enough. Five? Yeah. Oh, okay. six, actually. We've got six. a six group. Okay. I'm going to add one more, one more slide. Yeah. All right. So we'll take maybe not 15 minutes. So I'll start the timer for 12 minutes. Yeah, um, please join your breakout room. Let me know if you need to be assigned or if you're not in one. Do you want to pause the recording? No, oh, I will. Okay. Good call. Um, yeah, so we have one final activity and it's gonna take just, let's see, uh, three minutes, four minutes maybe. Um, oh, we've also got the notes. So we'll have you do this activity by participating in the Zoom chat. Uh, we've called it rapid fire questions. I've been told you could call it Mad Tea Party too. But what's gonna happen is that we will put a question out um, and if you're cheating, you can probably even look at them in the slides, so I don't do that yet. Um, we'll put a question out, and then I'll give you 30 seconds. Type your answer in the Zoom chat box to everybody, but don't hit send yet, please. Uh, and then I will say, three, two, one, send it, and everybody will send their answers at once. You can all take a minute and look at all the answers. 
see all the different perspectives, and then we'll go on to the next. There are four questions like that, and, and then we'll wrap it up. So without further ado, go to that Zoom chat box, make sure it's set to everybody, start typing your completion of my top takeaway from the breakout session was, but don't hit enter yet. Like 10 more seconds or so, and then I'll say the magic words. Okay, here we go. I hope you've got your answers typed and three, two, one, send it. Please hit enter with whatever you've got. Oh. Oh. This is great. Some oh, three people answers. said trust. Trust. Okay. Ah, uh, nice. This is great. Um, that was round one. We've got four rounds to go, three rounds to go. The next prompt, what was useful for me today was, this is a reflective one. Uh, thank you, A.M. Crespo. Um, this one is to help us also just get a sense of where you keyed in on useful pieces and what we can amplify and, and maybe help elaborate in the future. So again, in that chat box, can you please write your answer to what was useful for me today was? Two more seconds. Okay, three two, one, hit enter. Oh, nice, this one worked oh. nicely. There's a lot there. Delegate active, experiment shared, conversations, map, priorities. I think everyone's saying something different. Oh, this is cool. Sharing and yeah, learning Yeah, sharing and learning yeah. together. Mm. Conversations throughout these workshops we found are some of the most important ways to really reflect on it. Yeah, of course you can map it, but it's about being able to talk with other people about it. Okay, two more, two more Mad Tea Parties to go. Um, the biggest question raised by the mapping activity was, so it's a weird format. If you're not familiar with it, it can be a little tricky to get into. Maybe uh, it's about the format itself, or maybe it's something about the skills and how they work together. Maybe you just don't understand any of it. And so the whole activity is a question. Please let us know. 10 or 15 more seconds. It's a long, awkward silence, but as researchers, we're comfortable with that. Um, I hope you're ready. Let's go. Three, two, one, send it. <laughs> oh, I see some shrugging emoji, <laughs> laughing face. What can this be? Um, how to connect the dots, those concepts, connection. Yes, okay, interesting. The connections and the value chain model, um, super tricky. and. And grading the themes, very good. Um, we'll add a little bit more on the researchskills.net framework I, our website. I think we've got the uh, if, what is it? These Manzoni's levels of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to figure out where you can find it, but I'll explain that if you want to add it as a question in the Q and A. Okay, we can't get hung up on that because. We're gonna to try to get you out of here on time and I think we're already zero minutes late. Um, the next step I might like to take is, 
dot, dot, dot. This could be anything. Um, hopefully it's an interesting provocation about your skills, but boy, maybe you just need to go and get a glass of wine. Um, you tell me. We'll take another 20 seconds. And then three, two, one, hit enter. Oh, we've got a good, oh. a good set of things. Keep learning, sure. Fun workshops. Yes, we are always working on figuring out how to run these interactive style workshops. And um, nobody likes to just go and hear people talk. So doing stuff is the new, the new thing. Go back. Yes, cool. Please uh, see more about the website. Maybe you understand it. And um, Samantha mentioned, choose one of the key skills. I think one of the big things that we found with the mapping activity is that placing skills on the map lets you say, this is the one that I want to work on. And that's extremely powerful. You can find focus like that. All right. Closing last minute. Last minute. Last minute. So, oh, yes. Um, I think we haven't mentioned it before, but all of the stuff on the website is released under various licenses of Creative Commons. Um, and this is intentional. We do really want people to just take it and use it. Um, there is no like one right answer. It does need to be adapted and extended. And we hope that by putting it out there, as you can see, there's quite a lot to it, um, but hopefully it's useful just in small parts as well. Um, and oh, yeah, and so, yeah, you've already had a chance to use the kind of the inventory tool, the mapping tool. We do have a couple more tools um, that are meant to help dig into the framework. Um, so we will, our, the plan is to add a couple more. It's also open to contributions. We have been really surprised at the variety of scenarios that people have used the, the framework for in ways that you know, we would never have imagined. Um, so we hope to can continue hearing the stories of what people did with it. Um, and then hopefully some of those can be turned into common tools that will then uh, inspire other people to, to do the same. Um, so some of those use cases might be identifying your learning goals. We talked a lot about this today. Um, strategize with your team. And so the map version um, was for you as an individual contributor, but obviously you can do it with your teammates um, and then start to compare and fill in the holes. Um, so that's pretty interesting to take a team view on it. You can do the map or look at the different skills and use that as material to discuss it with your boss or bring it to your mentor or to your mentee as well. Uh, you can use it for career planning. We've heard of people who have used it uh, like to help build their CVs, for instance, or figure out what they don't want to do. Um, and also you can use it as a way to, to plan your next research project. Um, yeah, I think that is the last slide. Yeah, uh, we're a few minutes over. Thank you so much. If you do need to leave, please, uh, please do now. And thank you so much for joining. And we've got the Slido questions, but I'll pass it over to Sarah. Hi. That was so interesting. Um, thank you. And in the name of the community, uh, great work. And I personally learned a lot, so it was so self-interested, uh, this whole idea of uh, bringing you guys. Um, thank you. Um, we do have one question on Slido. I don't know if you can um, dedicate another five minutes to answering it. It goes, uh, it very, it, I think it dovetails really well with the last slide that you have, Tumami, which is, do you see um, the research skills framework as a good tool to evaluate UX researchers' performance or just to design their development plan? You see the research skills framework as a good tool to evaluate performance. Yes, we've had a lot of interest and kind of curiosity about how does this framework live with like official HR tools. Um, so pay grade, 
mostly, um, but also in terms of defining different roles within the organization. I think it, it is a good tool to evaluate performance, but one thing that the framework doesn't do is to define how your organization will um, like judge how that skill is carried out. And so it could be a baseline for an evaluation tool, but it would need to be complemented with um, that organizational context, I think. What do you um, think, Dave? Um, the point of this framework was actually to try and also build, like I think we mentioned, organization agnostic tool that would help researchers figure out where they are and where they could go next. So it could be used for it, but you'd actually need to have some sort of organizational levels framework and then like Tomomi saying, figure out what the correlation is. Um, maybe, maybe more work than it's worth. I think totally possible, but we wanted this to be something where you could say, where, where am I and where can I grow rather than what do I need to do to get this raise? Interesting. It is a conversation we've had um, in the group, small groups in the community as well, how, how to um, sometimes not only grow personally as a researcher and acquire new skills, but how to be or hire, depending on what you do, a team that then covers um, a spectrum of skills that then will be able to answer the research questions. Totally. And that's one of the activities that we haven't built yet. If you imagine that a team of people, designers, researchers, are mapping like this, you could then take, let's say, the uh, synthesis skill and chart out where is everybody in that synthesis skill. Maybe you've got a few people very early and maybe you've got a few people very far. So there are ways that you can start to view those profiles that we haven't um, totally detailed yet. Amazing. I would personally love to continue that specific part of the conversation. Again, self-interested. There's one more question. Uh, it's eight minutes past, um, if you can entertain. Um, the question is f uh, for, from Dani. And for newbies like me, what book would you recommend us to have a better understanding on the concepts we've mapped today? Yeah, um, I'll start. Danny. the concepts that we've mapped today are those skill themes. Each of them are made up of a set of discrete skills. The thing that I would actually recommend you do is, um, I mean, you've already done some of the mapping, but if you go to the skills link on the page and then you look at these themes, the first thing might be like whichever theme you're thinking about, just read through each of the skills. There are only three that aren't fully fleshed out. Most of those skills, I would say two thirds of them now, have resources listed that indicate either a conference talk, a book, uh, a blog article, something. And actually, if anybody here happens to see uh, a piece that's missing or something that they would like to add, you can email us or chat us and we'll add more resources. But I would say start there because this framework covers the breadth of everything that we've seen researchers do. So if you're just getting started, maybe those early level themes like coordination and data management and some of the, the resources in there, um, basics like usability testing handbook, uh, Steve Krug's rocket surgery type stuff, or um, maybe something a little higher order, but the skills should, the skills that you want to deal with should point to some of those. And if you look at the profile, the first junior profile, the researcher, what that's essentially saying is that coordination, data management, recruiting, usability testing, and basic interviewing are, are the skill areas that we think new researchers should really be investing in. So you can follow those threads. Um, and find the specifics from those areas. Yeah, all I've got to add is just to uh, start with one or two, not all of the, the skills, because there's so much. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, great. And I think, Tony, you had this other question, which is why this framework is so specific for research skills in comparison with other skill sets. And I think that, Dave, in a moment, this is a question I asked you in our interview. So can this framework um, be adapted or used in other disciplines as well, other than research? 
This is where you put the link to the interview in the chat, I think. Um, yeah, I will. Thank yeah. you for reminding me. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yes, short answer, yes. We think that the structure that underlines this framework that Dave explained in the beginning is applicable to other bodies of knowledge. So the way to think about, you know, how to acquire a craft um, is represented at kind of that abstract level. And then also kind of from a content perspective, a lot of the skills that are inside, you know, the research skills framework are applicable already to other adjacent disciplines like design, like analysis. And so there's a lot of transfer there as well. Um, we've met a few people that are keen to maybe try it with other bodies of, well, of knowledge. And so that would be super exciting if somebody, you know, kind of takes some of the, the concepts and builds it out. I would love to see that. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, guys, for, you know, staying, well, coming, first of all, staying over time. Thank you. Uh, Dave and Tomomi, wonderful uh, workshop, really interactive. Me too. I have learned a lot about all those things as well tonight. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, we can continue this conversation, uh, the conversation we started tonight. I invite you all to, um, if you want, of course, join the Design at Scale Slack, which is yet another channel that we're managing for this community. I am going to go insane uh, if they make up another one done in Turo. So here's, um, here's the link, um, we can, there's a channel specifically for research and there's another one for research ops. Join, uh, come and talk to us, it'd be lovely. And um, I say thank you all and uh, let's all get, grab, grab a glass of wine um, and relax and think about our future and everybody else. Keep learning. Thank all you right. both. Thank it was you wonderful. So much. Thank you. Such much. a great thing going here. Look forward to seeing what the community does next. Well, uh, let's be in touch. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone.